when the, when the Presidio, Presidio mutiny happened, I was, a, I, was a, I was a few days old. <laughs> <laughs> and later, uh, when I joined the Marine Corps, I was 18, uh, the Vietnam War could have been the U.S. Civil War. It could have been some, you know, some historical footnote. World War II, kind of the same thing, I thought. Um, and I joined today's military, the modern military, not the, not the bad military of the historic 17, 18, 1900s. Um, and it was, it took me four years with the third Marines to kind of come to my senses that I actually wasn't helping people of Okinawa and Japan. Um, and I, It took me somebody saying that I personally would have, might have the opportunity to set the, the nuclear fuse so we could uh, uh, annihilate uh, what they call rankheads. Um, and it took that thing in my mind. It's like, even, I didn't think it was going to happen, but it certainly it was a possibility because if anything went wrong over there in Iraq, uh, it was going to be uh, my opportunity to uh, do a, a nuclear holocaust type thing <laughs> and uh, that's that's my uh, that's my my turn and it was for me it was like a, a very personal thing there was there was no movement uh, Iraq had just invaded Kuwait a few hours prior to that um, and but I was hoping that maybe if I stood up somebody else would see something in the newspaper uh, about that um, and, you know, you, you didn't ask the question, but, you know, hearing these stories, I just think back to this one story, it's like, uh, you know, I held a press conference uh, outside my base to explain why I was against the war in Iraq and why I wasn't intending to get on the plane that evening with my, with my uh, artillery regiment. And while I was giving that press conference, my whole uh, unit was gathered around watching me in on the TV at the staging area at the hangar. Um, <laughs> we're at the barracks there. And when I came back, uh, I turned myself in to the, to the MPs, and they, they marched me over to the barracks, which only a few blocks away. And there was my unit, 150 odd people, lining uh, the railways of this three-story uh, uh, barracks we had. And they intentionally marched me below uh, uh, the railing. It was my uh, first first sergeant and my captain uh, had me, and they were sort of trying to drag me. Um, and so you know, so my whole unit could uh, yell at me and whatnot. And uh, and some some did they started chanting war, war. And then some of them started spitting on me. And that was that sort of sucked, right? Um, but then. Start, some, some of them started chanting peace, peace, and we had people like chanting war, and we had chanting, chanting peace, and we had uh, dozens of guys spitting on me, but there's uh, dozens of guys were taking the opportunity to spit on the commanding officer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think this was worth it. This was worth it. <laughs> so that was sort of the highlight. And later on, I refused to get on the airplane, and uh, people threatened to murder me, threatened to kill my family if I didn't get on there when they got back from Iraq. And it was a, you know, it was a very surreal uh, kind, of, uh, kind of evening. Uh, but I do, uh, going back to, it made all the difference to have a community of support uh, there when I was going through a trials, looking at five years in prison. It was, a, it was awesome to have a, a civilian attorney work with my uh, military defense attorney. Instead of five years, I was uh, I only did a few months in the Pearl Harbor Brig. Uh, it wasn't as shitty as, as the Presidio, I guess. Uh, so I was happy about that. Uh, but I expected to do five years in London. Uh, and when the Iraq War started in 2004, I tried to take what I learned about having a, a community of support and legal and uh, material uh, aid for families. And that's how we uh, grew up, uh, Courage to Resist. And we supported uh, resistor local uh, military people that have become local activists here in the San Francisco area, Stephen Funk, Pablo Davis. Yeah. Uh, we defended uh, 
Lieutenant Aaron Batata, the first uh, military officer to refuse to fight in Iraq. Uh, I led the successful seven-year uh, effort to free uh, Chelsea Manning, military intelligence officer. Hey. I also kicked off the less successful uh, attempt to uh, defend reality winner. Uh, as Still a great it ain't over. She's serving a five year mm -hmm. sentence at this time. Um, and away. at this time, we are trying to uh, work with people in the military who are angry that uh, President Trump has ordered them to build uh, massive immigrant <coughs> detention camps in the deserts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're expecting to house tens of thousands of immigrants on military bases, uh, primarily along the southern border on contaminated lands. And we see these posters right here, the Presidio, talking about uh, the Japanese internment camps. And this is the modern day you know, version of that. And I'm hoping that uh, more and more people in the military will speak up and, and do something. So that's what Courage Resist is up to. And, uh, I know a lot of you here support us and appreciate that. Thanks, you, Thank you. Question on a card, or you have a question, write it on a card quickly. Uh, some of my colleagues will be coming along the aisles to collect them uh, in just a minute or two. But as a historian, I have to say I'm curious. When you, you know, said that Vietnam wasn't in your headspace at all, right? When you were um, in the military, and you know, this is history but it's also a history that's kind of been forgotten about, right? The GI movement, GI activism. And I wonder if we, all the panelists, could kind of weigh in a little bit about what, what it means to remember this, why it's important to know these stories, um, you know, a little bit about kind of historical memory. Uh, yeah, I was host, host mute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of what uh, I believe as important is telling the stories of the Iraq War, the Gulf War resistors. Hundred, uh, more than a hundred of us in the Gulf War spoke out against that war, and at least a hundred of us were, were imprisoned. Uh, there was uh, almost 20 Marines uh, that were uh, taken to the Fort, uh, Camp Lejeune and were court-martialed in mass for refusing to uh, fight the Gulf War, and that's a that's a history that's kind of forgotten, and I'm trying to trying to do something different now with the with the with the last uh, people uh, stepping forward. Um, I again, you know, I was like in my mind, uh, I it really wasn't until I refused, and then uh, Vietnam era uh, veterans, many people in this room stepped forward to support me. I realized that I had this commonality. It wasn't historical thing, um, and as I was preparing to uh, refuse publicly, uh, people uh, gave me a VHS tape of the FTA movie, for example. I'm like, oh shit, I'm not the first person to think of this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of our Yeah, I think we need to have this history in our minds and tell the stories continuously so that those today who are struggling with the same issues, and there are many people in the military who are questioning uh, they were questioning it after the invasion. Uh, there were movements, the Iraq Veterans Against the War came out, the appeal for redress, 2,000 active duty and reserve members signed an appeal to Congress. Uh, and today, even there are uh, many who are asking these questions. And we need to come back to this history constantly because America remains a militaristic society. Mm -hmm. We are still involved in these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and now other wars in Iraq, uh, Libya and you don't even know how many countries we're bombing our, our troops in nowadays. Uh, and this militarization is continuing to drag down our country economically, financially, socially, politically. Uh, and we have to keep fighting it and resisting it. Morally. And, and hopefully these stories from those of us who are inside the green machine who spoke out uh, and have shown that we were successful and we were on the right side of history, that that story can continue, continue to be told and inspire further resistance and action today. Thank you. What we lawyers on the front line hope 
is that when we put our heart and soul into defending one particular citizen at a time, that there may be lessons learned as a result of that case. Sometimes there are. A few times there are. The Presidio, as I said, did embarrass the army. They were horrified. The general counsel uh, who advised uh, Stanley Reeser, the secretary of army at the time, was very angry. That Washington uh, made known that they were upset. And I do think that court martials were better for some time after that. Are they perfect? No. Our civilian system is far from perfect. And uh, sadly, I don't think memory lasts very long. Yeah. I, I think, as, as you say, you have no perspective on what happened in, in the Vietnam uh, situation or how, how it impacted on the particular trials and how absurd the military's actions were in trying to put these young people in jail for 15 years. Uh, but they did learn a lesson. How long it lasts, we're not sure. We just have to find injustice. We have to fight it. And we will. Years after all that, I, I marched for many years with you know, radical veterans organizations. I'm still a member of Veterans for Peace. I know there's plenty of people from Veterans Peace here. And uh, one of the things we always said was, you know, first you fight the battle, and then you fight, fight the battle of summation. And the battle of summation, that's part of it right there. <laughs> the battle of summation goes on and on. And, uh, um, you know, one time, there was, in the 80s sometime, there was, it was the men's movement came up. And, and uh, you know, everybody sitting around the circle beating drums or doing all the things they were doing. And, and the, our veterans group was called to be the resource table outside of this conference of the men's movement. And, you know, whenever the speakers were done, they would have a break, they would drift by our table. And, and those, it was right about the time that the Rambo movies came up. And the, the people at the conference, all these guys at this men's movement conference, would come out and the first thing they would do is they would inevitably, they'd apologize for not being a veteran. Well, we were the anti-war veterans, so we were hardly carbon about that. <laughs> and the second thing they'd do is they would tell us about how their kids loved the Rambo movie. And it was, you know, after like dozens of guys had come by, I started asking, well, well what did you do during the war? They were all my age. And it turned out that they had been heroic resistors in some form or another. They had done all kinds of things. And I started to ask, well, did you ever tell your kids about that? No. And uh, like guy after guy would come by and complain that his, that his kids love Rambo, but then it turned out that they would never told his own kids about you know, the time that they had gone down to the recruitment center or done this or that or stood up in some way, whatever way they had done it. And they hadn't told their own history through their own kids, and then they couldn't figure out why their kids love Rambo, you know? <laughs> well, at that point was when I realized that I had a lifetime obligation, you know? First we sat down and sang, we shall overcome, but that I sort of had a life, I was never, you're never gonna get time off for good behavior, you know? That you gotta keep fighting that fight of summation, you know, to keep bringing it back, bringing it back, and bringing it back, because at this point in American history, we are in a fight for the soul of America. And if we don't reach out and find the, uh, you know, the lessons that have been learned the hard way, um, uh, why then uh, how can we hope to go forward and, and have success? We focused on and spent a lot of time tonight talking about the Presidio 27 and how and why the guys sat down because they were sick of the terrible conditions in the stockade. And we also talked about the detention centers. Um, we are sending, we, because we're allowing it to happen, are sending two, three, four, five-year-old children, separating them from their families, and sending them thousands of miles away to these detention centers. Yes, we have the exhibit about what we did during the Second World War to the Japanese. The Japanese went as families. These are children, and it continues, and it's getting worse. And I'll say again, because 
We're allowing it to happen because we're not there, because we're not protesting it enough, and because we're not stopping it enough. And I do think that we elders have an obligation to draw the connections between what happened and what we did to protest the war and stockade conditions and what we need to do today. And as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about how horrific the stockade conditions are. Well, what on earth is going on in these private prisons, private, private federally funded prisons that lock up black and brown people for what? For drugs? That if you have the resources, you get out of jail and you don't have to serve a sentence. It goes back to what happened during our military activism. If we were smart enough, if we had the resources, we could have attorneys that would protect us and that we knew we were getting the best support possible. But there are people in this country and the division gets larger and larger every day who don't have those resources and who keep on being beaten down. And we've got to do something. And I think it's making the connections, it's making those connections between wars, it's making those connections between the military and the police, it's making the connections right. and saying, yep. we're going to stop it. Yep, yep, thank you.